this meeting to order. So first up, we have the roll call. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, do I have a motion for the approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. First up in discussion is 3.1 Business Services Preliminary Audit Pop Up with Auditors from Enfield, Meach, and Companies PC. Mr. President, members of the board, <coughs> it's uh, been customary for our auditors to present to you during our work session um, to give you an update as to our annual audit progress. So, Mike Lazan from Enfield Meach, he has some others who are behind the curtain. Uh, continuing to work on our audits as we speak. Uh, he is here to present an update for fiscal year 22. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Michael Lazan. I'm the audit partner with Einfeld Meach. Uh, we are the independent auditors hired by the district through the uh, RFP process to perform three different audits. Uh, for the district. Uh, so first I want to start off by thanking Mike, all the staff, payroll, HR, um, disbursements, tax payable, procurement, capital assets. We have touched almost every area in this district, transportation, uh, things you wouldn't think an auditor would normally deal with, but uh, because of the requirements placed on us by the state of Arizona, uh, it's not just financial, but it's also compliance with USFR and their state requirements. And so we're going to go through some of what we found today. And it's as the course, if there are any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer what I can. Uh, I do want to thank I have a couple of teammates, as Mr. Murray said, in the back. And I have one person working remotely on this audit. Um, and so this is our third and final day. And hopefully we'll get home before this number is too bad. So, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've gone over this before. We are the uh, number one auditors for school districts for governments in the state of Arizona. This is our only focus is on governments and nonprofits. Uh, and so I think we have a good amount of expertise in this area. And so I'd be happy to um, move on to the next part of the presentation. So I talked about three different audits. One being financial. This is looking at all the money that comes into the district and all the money that goes out. And we're ensuring that not that it's free from 100% error, but we give an opinion on free from my financial misstatement due to error or fraud. And that's not a statement of perfection. So in this case, uh, most likely, unless something changes here in the next, uh, as we're wrapping up a few areas, you again receive what's called an unmodified opinion on financial statement presentation, which is the highest opinion you can give, which means your financial statements, again, are materially free from misstatement due to error or fraud. So that's a good opinion to receive. The second audit we're doing is on federal compliance. So because the district receives and expends more than $750,000 in federal awards, in fact, you are millions of dollars in federal awards through Title I, plus special education, nutrition, all the different programs, and of course, these last few years, all the ESSER, ARPA, all the COVID money that's come in, it's greatly increased your federal expenditures. And so we're required to audit those funds and again, give an opinion on compliance. And I'll get into that in a little bit. In the third and final area, uh, is the USFR, uh, Uniform System of Financial Records, also known as the USUFR. Um, 
<laughs> not here. Uh, this is the state compliance requirements that are kind of outside the normal scope of, an, of a financial audit or a federal compliance audit. And so we're looking at things like student activities, transportation, auxiliary, extracurricular activities, uh, certain requirements on payroll that aren't necessarily under the fair labor or federal law, but the state says, I want the auditor to look at these specific uh, 260 plus questions uh, in addition to your normal uh, financial and federal compliance audits. So uh, as far as some timelines go, uh, for USFR, we, we kind of separate this into two different visits. So we were out here in September uh, and then wrapping up this visit right now. Uh, and these are kind of all the different, I'm going to go through all of them, different areas we focused on uh, for each visit. Um, federal compliance, there were two federal programs for fiscal 22 which were required to provide an audit for. Um, the two of them being, one is the, uh, all of the COVID money, ESSER 1, 2, 3, also known as the Education Stabilization Funds, were required, were required because those monies were designated by the federal government as being high risk, were required to audit those every year in which you would spend more than $750,000 of those money. And so this will probably be a major federal program next year and potentially the year after that and until basically the money runs out. Uh, the second uh, federal program we audited was Special Education Cluster. Uh, this is another federal program where we're required to rotate in every few years because you expend and receive more than $750,000 in uh, special education cluster monies. And so for both of those federal programs, the great news is we had no findings to report. Um, and it, you, again, received what's called an unmodified opinion on compliance. Not a statement of perfection, but just saying we reviewed the compliance requirements as determined by the compliance supplement. And so the federal government tells us as auditors, you have to look at these specific areas. Uh, and so we looked at those different areas being allowability, eligibility, maintenance of effort, procurement, uh, and the equipment, especially on the ESSER side, because there's a lot of that money is being used to buy um, kind of capital stewardship type items. And so, uh, again, we have no findings uh, for those federal programs, which is great news. So kind of the biggest area, the one that we focus most on this trip um, for November, is financial statements. And so this is taking a look at the end of the year numbers, your AFR is done, your uh, audit file submitted to the Auditor General. Uh, we are now ready to, you're essentially ready for audit. And so uh, we're coming on site looking at cash, revenues, expenditures, uh, running an analysis, comparing those to prior year. Uh, also looking for supporting documentation, we can utilize confirmations from the uh, ADE, uh, we can utilize uh, requests from the Auditor General, all, all these different areas. And one of the new areas this year uh, to focus on was, it's, it's called GASB 87. It's a governmental accounting standards board issued a new, uh, new requirement for presentation. So we're having to capture all of the leases that the district has. And previously we reported them um, this is revenue and expense, or maybe there's a note disclosure, but now we're capturing all your cell phone towers that you're leasing out, and you have a brand new data hub box that's sitting on a couple school sites. Uh, and, you know, those are very long-term leases, and I think the cell phone towers go out for 55 years, and you think about reflecting $13,000 a year this year, and that goes up 15% every five years, and it's over 55 years. All of a sudden, we have a $750,000 contract over the life of the agreement. So all of that is now being captured and put onto the financial books of the district. And so that was a, uh, a big change this year. And so uh, Mike and Neil were able to get together and get all the agreements uh, pulled and so we're able to uh, present those on your books this year. So now I get to talk about the, uh, what we found, um, the less fun part. The good news is, uh, these areas, in order for improvement, are specific to the USFR, um, not going to be reported as part of your single audit or part of your financial statement audit. And so th these are compliance requirements that we're going to report directly to the state, uh, to the Auditor General, and then they kind of look at them and determine, okay, do we think we need to follow up, or are we okay with just kind of telling them to improve next year? And so um, I will say these are preliminary. Uh, there are opportunities for the district to 
uh, clear as many of these as possible. The USFR is not required to be finalized until March 31st, 2023. We always like to get it done a little bit before then. But uh, there is chances if, if documentation can be located to clear some of these uh, findings that we're going to know here. Uh, the first area uh, was student attendance uh, for uh, seven AOI students reviewed full-time equivalency statements were not maintained. This is at the end of the um, students, uh, what they did during the year on the Arizona Online program, and basically trying to fill out, okay, did they actually do all the things they were supposed to do minutes to get that 1.0 FTE? And so we're, I think we're still waiting on those. Um, for three students, two AOI and one other student, uh, we didn't have proof of Arizona residency. Sure, they were not catching the river every day to come over to school from California, but um, you know, we just had to have that uh, verification on file. Uh, and same thing, one of the newer, newer requirements um, under the state of Arizona is that you, you have to have a legal document to support the name on file uh, for every student. And so in this case, for one student uh, out of 15, I believe, we didn't have that legal document. Um, Three of, and if you have students who kind of just disappear, they have 10 consecutive absence days, there's a certain requirement of how you report that student attendance. Um, and in this case, for three of those 15 students, it wasn't properly documented. And then what we also do is, for partial day, um, this is where it gets really fun as auditors, uh, we get to go look at sign-in, sign-out logs at the different schools and go, okay, Timmy came in at 1 o'clock and he left at 3 o'clock. This is calculating um, how, much, how much time the student was in the school, and we noted several partial mistake calculations. And so uh, just a few areas for improvements on student attendance. This is kind of the area. I will say student attendance is the area where we have the most findings of any uh, area at any school district because you just have so many different hands touching it. You've got all the – you have to trust the high school kid to fill in his name correctly and then put the time correctly, and then you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, a couple areas that we did note for information technology. Uh, a couple of these are repeats, and a couple of them actually were cleaned up as well. Um, so the district disaster recovery plan does not include all the required elements. In addition, there was not a test performed of the recovery plan in FY22. It doesn't mean take down your entire system. It just means you have to take a walk, like an imaginary walkthrough of what would happen if our system crashed and what would our steps be to basically put everything back together? Um, last year, we noted that all of the district's uh, software programs, that none of them had the uh, validation, multi-factor authentication. We all get a text now on our phones whenever we try to log into our bank or do anything these days. Um, and so uh, last year, we had the finding that none of the district software programs had this in place. Well, now, I believe Visions and several other ones now have this capability in place. So there's still a couple of the programs that the district's still utilizing that don't have these uh, multi-factor authentication uh, methods for verifying who's logging in. So again, it's just more about putting pressure sometimes on those vendors. Hey, we want to keep you in your program, but you've got to help us out here. And then we, uh, we just noted that uh, there's some areas where we feel like maybe some employees have a little too much access into the system. We didn't note anything uh, being done wrong. It's just maybe there's some areas for cleaning up uh, who has access to do exactly what within the system. And so we, you know, we have a list of those that we're going to provide to Mike and to IT, and then they can kind of take a look and see maybe if there's areas where they can shut off someone's access or change it from active to just read only. But they might still need to see the information, they just don't need to be able to press the button. Uh, a couple coding findings noted. Um, there are at least uh, two items where um, one was actually a uh, expenditure travel reimbursement was coded as a taxable travel reimbursement. However, the person did spend the night, uh, so then in theory it's not a taxable travel reimbursement. It should have just been a normal travel reimbursement. Uh, and then there were two revenues, one in special education and ESSER. The uh, USFR lays out in very much detail where uh, revenue should be recorded. And in this case, um, special education ended up in a special education fund. It's just not in the right fund segment. And then and the same thing, uh, there was some extra money received that ended up, I believe, in ESSER 1 or 2, but it was ESSER 3 money or 
some funny combination of that. Uh, there's one more. We head on student activities. Uh, so right now, the way the district policy is set up is that there is a required form that has to be used for all student fundraisers. And we noted uh, in a couple instances where that required form is not being used for that approval process. There is an approval process in place, so there is a process for all the fundraisers to still get approved. Uh, but the, since you have a policy that says you have to use the form, um, either you use the form or you figure out maybe the policy isn't working for the district and we want to go kind of an alternate route of how we approve uh, student fundraisers. And so you just kind of got to pick which one you want to go with. Um, doing our review for stewardship capital assets. This is where one of our staff members got to go around to one of some of the school sites and figure out um, stuff that was either on the listing or on the stewardship listing is still here, kind of select at random. Unfortunately, we found uh, two items from the capital asset listing that could be not located, that could not be located. Um, however, they were kitchen fryers from 1995. Chances are they've been ripped out and uh, replaced. Uh, just the listing just needs to be cleaned up a little bit to remove those items uh, when that does happen. Probably it was an entire remodel of a kitchen. Uh, new items were put into place. Um, so sometimes what happens when you end up doing that is going back to 1995 and trying to find the asset that doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, and then in two, in two instances, uh, there were two capital asset items that had the wrong uh, tag numbers on them. Okay, uh, a few items that are outstanding as of right now. Um, one of them being the compensated absences, the leave. Uh, we're waiting for the schedule to support. Uh, you know, if everyone quits at June 30th, this is how much we all owe all of our employees for all their vested leave time. And so we're waiting on that schedule. The second one is um, because of the wind down of the Lake Havasu Employee Benefit Trust, um, the company that was providing the service of maintaining um, kind of the records said, well, we're done, uh, but didn't really seem to notify the district that they were done tracking all that stuff. So the district is going to go in and is currently working with the third party administrator previously to try and gather some of the information. There isn't a whole lot of activity, obviously, for the fiscal 22. Mainly it's just taking the excess or the premiums that had accumulated and are now being used to pay into the new employee benefit trust. Uh, we just kind of need a, a good summary of some of the expenses and revenues that came in and out of those funds. <coughs> okay. So what's next? Uh, so there are just a few cleanup items. I noted some of the financial items. Uh, federal, I think we're mostly done. You might have one or two questions left. USFR, mainly that is just uh, a couple cleanup items on attendance, student activities. Um, and hopefully we can finalize uh, that here in the next little bit. Uh, these two items uh, are the only things required at this point to complete what's known, I should have changed the name. It's not comprehensive annual financial report, it's annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, they changed the name last year, I forgot to update that, so I'm sorry. Um, that's due by December 31st, 2022. Uh, that is what you use to apply for the awards through the Government Finance Authors Association and ASBO, um, and those are the awards that help you with your bond rating and kind of maintain a lower interest rate which, of course, we have one of those coming up, so it's definitely important to keep those awards going. Uh, and then, as I said before, the USFR and single audit reporting package are due on March 31st, 2023. We don't anticipate any issues with those being uh, done on time. Comments. So, 
I'd like to just make a comment. Um, so I would like to thank everyone in the room, including directors, superintendent, board members, um, mainly mainly envisions. There's a section that says worker bees for user IDs, like a user role um, title. I don't know who put that there, but that was established when we rolled to visions, when we implemented visions. But I would like to thank the worker bees um, for everything they do. Uh, and we are all worker bees, depending on the hat we're wearing at that particular time. Uh, but I have a lot of respect for each of you across departments in all that you do. Because this is, <clears throat> I hear this from time to time, and it frustrates me a little bit. This is not the business department audit. It's not my audit. It's the district audit. Um, so I appreciate all who take ownership in that process because it is our audit. It's not, it's not just the business department. It's everything that we do from HR to federal monies that we take in with title and special services, everybody, transportation, the school sites. So thank you for all of us worker bees who wore the worker bee hat throughout the year. So I appreciate everything you do. This time of year gets very chaotic. And uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And we will do this again seven, eight months from now. It just, it just continues to, it seems like every time I turn around, it's audit season. So thank you um, for all of you in this room and who are not in this room for your contributions to the audit. Yeah. And just from my perspective, I want to thank everybody because I know this gets busy and everybody's like, oh, they work so hard to get this done. You work this hard all year to make sure that you have the things in the right place and you're ready to go when they do come in and meet with us. So I just appreciate everything you do all year long to make sure that this is as smooth as it possibly can be. And just as he said, it's not perfection. It's a place where we see, okay, what are those places we need to get back on and work on? Um, and, and there's nothing in here that we can't address. Um, but I appreciate your work and Mr. Murray and all the work you guys to lead all of that to make sure we're, we're in a place where we need to be. And as, as he said, this actually encompasses all of our departments. It's not just one department. You, you've looked at things that were from every aspect of our district. So thank you to everyone who, who works on this and makes it a great process. I just want to just also mention that um, I've been through a number of audits in different areas in my life, and there's always something to improve on. This is just mainly for anybody watching about an audit. There's always something to improve on. And if you're kind of wondering, okay, well, does this mean that it was a good audit, a bad audit, or whatever, what we want to look at is bond ratings. How have we been doing with our bond ratings? And we have excellent bond ratings. So you can kind of see that we are really addressing the audit process and always constantly working to correct and make things as perfect as we can be. Yeah, and I will say there um, there were findings that we noted in last year's presentation to the board, including over transportation and certain processes with uh, procurement, where we had multiple findings in procurement, and we had a finding on the way that the uh, I think students were being reported for transportation. And so those were cleaned up. And so we do see improvement. Um, when audit findings do come up, sometimes they take a couple of years to address because of the way the timing it works. You've already started six months into the next fiscal year. Um, uh, so it is good to see improvement, and I, I believe that whatever the findings we brought up today, as Ms. Stone said, uh, you know, those can be addressed in the next year. So. The only thing that kind of caught my attention is um, – student activities and the fundraisers and everything, and it makes sense that keeping tabs on eight different school sites and all of those individual clubs would be pretty um, burdensome. Mr. Lazan um, mentioned that we could either modify our policy or just do better kind of enforcement of the policy that we already have. Is there something that our board could consider that you think would, would support the finance department better in that area. Do you recommend like a, a change to our documentation or just some sort of more uh, better oversight? So <clears throat> I think that that's something that we'll have to look at in the coming weeks and months to determine what that's going to look like. Mr. Vazan uh, provided some, some excellent uh, 
just basically a suggestion over uh, all the experience that he has and the many districts that he's uh, interacted with th throughout the years that there are, the board can adopt from the beginning or approve from the beginning of each fiscal year certain fundraisers that you deem acceptable. And then once that happens, then the sites are free to govern themselves at that point based on the outline that was established or approved, those approved fundraisers that occurred at the beginning of each year from the board. So there's a couple of things that we can that we can look at, consider. That are, where we're getting hung up on is we actually have an established form, and then when you have big sites like the high school, who they're constantly fundraising because of all of the clubs that they have going on up there, they have streamlined the process, which, which I'm totally in favor of, where they're using a Google Doc that, that tracks everything from start to finish, and then it simply towards the end is just an electronic approval for, from the superintendent. But because that technically is not the form, that's the issue. So we have a form, but the electronic approval is not the form that's been approved. So there's some things that we can look at. I mean, it's really minor in comparison. I mean, it's just Becky's still approving them. I mean, you can still clearly see that she's looking at the, the approval for that fundraiser and initialing it, but it's in a Google Doc or a Google form and not the actual form. So we'll, we'll, we'll get around that. Thank you, Mr. Ozano. I appreciate you and your staff's work, and of course, the work of these. Where would we be in life without work? That's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to present. So. All right. Uh, next up, we have 3.2 student achievement state testing. So um, I'm going to be presenting our letter grades from 2022, and I want to start out by saying, um, I don't know in my uh, 20 years, and, and I guess we didn't get letter grades in the very beginning, I don't know that we have really taken a comprehensive look at our letter grades across all of the schools. We've looked at assessments year after year. We've looked when there um, were some issues, but I think as a whole, um, we haven't taken a deep dive into a letter grade. Um, and I want to say that this really wouldn't be possible um, without having someone um, focused, at least as one of her jobs, on assessments, um, who's Jamie Tuneman. And so, she really has been instrumental in taking this apart and now working on how do we be better moving forward. And so um, pulling all of this together is not something that um, any one person did alone, but I just wanted to um, thank her because I think this is, is sorely, sorely needed. Um, and I look back and I look back and I wish, gosh, it would have been great to have had this information a long time ago. Um, and so we're going to look at the way that letter grades um, are figured for our elementary schools. It's very similar for our middle school and then our high school. Um, I want to point out that this is a, a snapshot um, of how a school is. Um, and as someone who has been in public schools in Arizona for her entire life, um, I don't necessarily think that uh, the way that we're looking at schools um, shows all of what schools are, for better or worse. So um, this is uh, the system, and, and being that I know the system, I, I very much um, want to work uh, with the state board. Um, to support them to make sure that they understand what, what this really looks like. So looking at elementary schools, um, uh, the first way that they are 
um, examined is based on proficiency, and that's 30% of their score. And so that is just how students did on um, their AASA, the state math test, and the state English language arts test. Um, MSAA is our 1% approximately of students who take a, an alternative assessment because of disabilities. And so 30% is proficiency. The other 50, uh, or the next 50% is growth. So this is looking at how students grow over a year. Um, and so this is just fourth through eighth grade. Um, we wouldn't look at growth for third graders because the first time they're getting tested is in third grade. So we're looking at their growth um, over, over that time. And then uh, the next is EL, and we're looking at proficiency in growth. Um, and this is on the Azela test. So these are only English learner students, and this is a separate test that they take once a year. Um, and then there are points um, that you can pick up in a, a different ways, and I'll, I'll talk about that, um, and some bonus points. So really the vast, vast majority of elementary schools is looking at um, state testing, which is a, a one-time event. So looking at, and this is for FY22, so this is last spring, we can look at our percent of students tested. You need to, by federal law, um, have at least 95% of your students tested, and so we can see that all schools met that threshold. Um, and again, thinking um, where we were in terms of coming off COVID, and, and that to me is a number to be proud of, that, teach, uh, that, that administrators and teachers were able to get those students in. Um, also to point out, when, when parents um, won't let their child be tested because they disagree with testing, let's say, um, which is sometimes encouraged by different politicians, that counts against us. Um, so a parent cannot opt out of testing. We're required by law to test them. But sometimes parents do opt out by calling their student out for the day um, and making sure that they're not present. So taking a deep dive into what proficiency actually looks like, um, proficiency is made up of some points uh, that you get for students being partially proficient, proficient, and highly proficient. So if the student's partially proficient, they get 0.6. Uh, proficient is 1.0, and highly proficient student gets 1.3. Um, and so um, if a student has an invalid test, they count as not um, tested. Proficiency points are capped at 30, and so really we're looking at our proficiency um, as it compares with other schools. Uh, there is another way, uh, and you'll see one of the schools got their proficiency points. This is through stability proficiency, um, and it looks at um, that school's stability um, for proficient scores over the course of three years. And so for that proficiency, um, you can see what the schools got, or Grande was the school that, that got the stability proficiency, um, but you can see what their scores were at in terms of um, proficiency. So that's just how students do ELA and math. The next area is growth, and as a reminder, this is worth 50% of the letter grade for K-8. And this looks at the growth of a student um, over three years. So it tracks a particular student. Um, so Jamie Festadagle took the test in third grade. It, it tracks my growth um, to fourth grade and fifth grade. Now these students, um, what we need to understand is we are missing a lot of data and we changed tests during these years. And so we can see um, that fourth grade students didn't have that second year of data because of COVID, um, but we're looking at growth from AZ Merit to AASA. Um, same thing with fifth grade students, grade four AZ Merit, grade five AASA. Um, eighth grade students we're looking at, so they're eighth graders now, grade five AZ Merit. There was no test for grade six, grade seven AZ Merit, um, and grade eight. AASA. So we're looking at that growth, but we have to remember that there was a COVID year in between. And so for growth, you can see where the schools um, ranged in terms of growth percentage. 
Um, and so thinking about where students uh, were, um, in some cases prior to COVID, uh, last year, uh, sorry, the year, uh, and then last year. Um, the other important thing to note is during this time, we have implemented a brand new curriculum. Um, we had students who um, were coming in with, with lots of different things, and so um, we can look at our growth measure. Bless you. So here is EL. This is something that's interesting. It is worth 10% of the grade, and it is only looking at students, EL students who have been with us. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the proficiency and growth also, it's the full academic year. So these are students who are with, are with us um, from within the ten, first 10 days of starting school. So it's only phase students. So EL, you, it counts as 10% of your grade as long as you have 10 students. So in most of our schools, we have somewhere between um, 5 and, like, 12. Um, so all of these students, all of these schools have a soup by smoke tree and star line, um, meet the 10 threshold, and so we're talking by a student or two. Smoke tree is our largest EL population. Do you know what that is off the top of your head? 14. Starline has 12 EL students um, and have a soup by is, is I think, 11. Um, Starline's EL data was not counted um, because uh, two students did not test, um, and so they got nothing. Um, they, they didn't give them a score. So we are appealing um, their EL score um, because they did have students move into proficiency, which is worth five points, um, and they had students who grew. Um, but I do think it's important to understand, and this is not their state test, this is specifically the test that examines their EL proficiency. So how proficient are they in the English language? And the way that this test is scored, which is fascinating, um, it is listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, your score is your lowest level of proficiency. So if you are intermediate, proficient, 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 your score is intermediate. Um, this is really important. Students continue to have EL services until they they test proficient in every single area. Um, but this is a very um, heavily weighted category. Uh, and the students, the schools that don't have anything there, it's because they have less than 10. The next area is acceleration and readiness. Uh, the state calls this choose your own adventure because there's a number of ways that you can get points. Um, you can get up to 10 points. So the first five um, are coming from grade three minimally proficient. And so what this looks at is, is your third grade cohort, is the percentage of minimally proficient shrinking um, to last year's third grade cohort. So you want that, that percentage to go down. So we're no longer looking like for growth, we were tracking the same student. We're now tracking the cohort. Um, and the reason why this is worth as so much is because the goal is that students are ready to read at third grade. So this is specific to ELA. The next area where you can get points is chronic absenteeism. Um, and so it looked that you reduced chronic absenteeism um, from two years ago to last year. Um, again, the two years ago, we had many students who were online. We had students who were coming parts of days. Um, last year was a full regular year with full regular rules. Um, and so comparison of the two is interesting. Um, but they are looking to shrink the rate of chronic absenteeism from year to year. The next group, that, uh, the next category where you can get points is subgroup uh, improvement, and this just compares cohorts from one year to the next um, and their subgroups. So, did you increase the score um, of your? And it's by math and ELA. So, did you increase uh, EL students' uh, scores in? Um, ELA. Did you increase uh, um, 
economically disadvantaged students in math. And so for each group where you um, improve those scores, you can get two points. Um, and then you get another two points for special education inclusion. So you can see where our schools got points. Um, not surprisingly, no school got points for chronic absenteeism. Um, and so, you know, we were in a place where we were told to quarantine students and follow those guidelines um, so that we can make sure that we keep schools open. Um, but you can see that no schools got points in that area. Bonus points, you can get bonus points in special education enrollment. Um, and so high populations of full academic year students enrolled in special education and then science proficiency. Um, you can get up to three points for the, uh, the science test um, based on um, where you were in terms of the state's uh, average percentage and your school's percentage. So you can see where our schools got bonus points. Um, Starline and Nautilus uh, both got um, bonus points for AZ Psi, and then um, all schools uh, got bonus points for their special education population. So overall, here are the letter grades of the schools. Um, we can see that Or Grande Classical Academy, who had the curriculum prior um, and has now been using it for a number of years, is an A. Um, and so it's expected we would see an implementation dip. Um, and then we are, we already have put in um, to challenge Starline and Nautilus's um, grades um, from the state. And so that window closes next Monday. Um, and at that time, those grades should officially go to under review until a point where we can officially challenge, we, where we can challenge those, those grades with the state. I understand uh, the, how we're challenging Starling. Where are we challenging Nautilus? We're, we're challenging Nautilus on um, the absentee rate. Okay. Um, and so in order to challenge, it has to substantially change the, the letter grade. And so while I would challenge all of the schools on the letter grade, um, the rules require us to have a substantial change in grade. And so Nautilus um, is within the range that uh, they're, up, they're, they're less than a point, or sorry, less than two points away from a C. And so we were able to use that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions about the letter grades for the elementary schools? Jamie, did I miss anything? The, the NX smoke tree is 21. Thank you. So just to clarify, with the absenteeism, we're kind of outside of the range where we're now in danger of having to quarantine or anything like that. But we've still been keeping, I think anyway, the general encouragement of if your child is sick, please keep them at home. And so do we feel like that is one of the impacts that we're seeing on our letter grades? Well, I, I, would, I would surmise that our absentee rates look better this year than last year. Um, and we have gone back to some of the things, the attendance awards, um, the reminders. We did not do it. We suspended anything that was bring your child to school sick related last year. So I would, I would surmise that those would be two points this year. But again, um, when we're looking at the quality of the school, and I absolutely think that school attendance matters, um, we just have to know that that is, a two, that is two points that I don't know that um, the school really has full control of making sure parents take their kids to school. Especially not during COVID. What does define chronic absenteeism? 10% or more, so 18 days. 18 days, thank you. Any other questions about elementary school? Thunderbolt is very much the same way. The only difference with Thunderbolt is um, their acceleration and readiness looks at grade eight math. 
Um, and so thinking about some milestones where we want students to be, they need to be ready to read in third grade, read, you know, they're reading in third grade, and they need to be algebra ready by um, grade eight. And so those, those are where those milestones come from. We just have to remember that we're only looking at those two things through the lens of one state test. Um, but that's where they get that. And they can get five points for that grade eight math performance. They can get two and a half um, points by increasing uh, the percentage of students who are highly proficient or, and two and a half points for minimizing um, the students who are minimally proficient. So again, Thunderbolt tested 99% of their students. Proficiency is figured the same way. Thunderbolt um, got stability proficiency, um, was the creator of the two. Growth is figured the same way. So remember that these students' growth, if you're a seventh grader, we're looking all the way back to fourth grade, and then we're looking uh, for growth in sixth grade to seventh grade. And for eighth graders, we're looking all the way back to their growth in fifth grade, and we're looking for improvement in seventh grade to eighth grade. So you can see um, Thunderbolt got uh, 32.63 points um, out of the possible 50. Yes, Jamie. So the growth is a total of the previous two numbers? Yes. I, th I thought in your other slide with the elementary schools that it didn't always add up. I don't know. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I was trying to create a limit each time. Yes, no, yeah. So look at uh, Oro Grande. I, I didn't get a chance to see Yes. That. My quick math tells me that other ones are correct. Okay. Were they capped at 19? Is that what the idea was? Um, or something like that? Yeah, this is 50. Okay. Okay. So these may be off, but yeah. So, or Grande is? The 47 Grande. These two numbers. Thank you. That was excellent math, RT. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got them from my point. I can't. I can't feel their grade. I feel it. You want an A plus. Same thing. So here's where their points are to earn. They got two and a half points um, for increasing the percentage of students who are highly proficient in math. Um, the maximum you can get for subgroup improvement um, is six, and then they got the two points for the this, this SPED inclusion, and then you can see 10 points is the maximum. They got bonus points. We got special education enrollment and science proficiency, um, and they got um, the two points for special education. Um, inclusion, uh, sorry, in, uh, um, overall enrollment, and so their letter grade is a C. Any questions about the middle school? It's very similar to the elementary schools. Okay, so now it changes. Um, the high school letter grades are different. 30% of the high school is based on proficiency, and these are full academic year students. Um, who took the ACT, um, and they do not score all parts of the ACT here. Um, they are looking at ELA and math. Um, so uh, the ELA is made up of writing, um, and then the ELA portions. Um, this, am I correct, Jamie, that the science portion of the ACT does not count in the letter grade? Um, or the MSAA, which is the alternative assessment for students with special needs, and we're only looking at 11th graders. Growth, um, we're looking at um, growth, and we'll, I'll talk about what that growth looks like um, at the high school. 
ELL proficiency and growth is the same 10 points split between proficiency and growth. Um, we're then looking at graduation rate. What is very important and fascinating, uh, the 20 points that the high school is eligible for for graduation rate is based on their 2021 school year. So there's nothing the high school could do in the current year of their letter grade. It's their previous year. Um, and so that's the, the points that the high school will get for this year in graduation rate is last year's students. So that's a kind of interesting thing. College and career uh, readiness self-report uh, that is based on a um, report that the high school does uh, for college and career readiness and then bonus points. High school tested, 96.31% of students. Their proficiency um, is uh, worth the same point values. And so you can see they got 16.23 points. Their growth, um, growth is interesting because um, we don't, we currently are now giving students the ACT Aspire. Um, but for last year's students, they did not have that. And so um, even though the growth percentile is worth 20%, ADE is still going to need to make sure that this is statistically reliable um, and they're not, they're not quite sure yet. But so we can see the growth. Um, and in this case, we're looking at both ninth grade and 11th grade students are counted. Um, so for our 11th grade students, we're looking at their growth from grade 8 to grade 10 to grade 11. So that is a very long span of time. Um, and grade 9 students, grade 6 AZ Merit, grade 8 AZ Merit, and grade 9 ACT Aspire. So again, those are, those are some, it's the same span of time as everyone else. Uh, it's not because they have gaps where there wasn't tests offered. So you can see their growth, they got 14 points. EL is worth 10%, it's the same uh, way. And the high school got all um, 10 of those EL points. They have a little bit larger population. Uh, their end count is over 20. Um, can you check, what is it? 19, so it's very close to 20. So grad rate, um, you get a different weight on your grad rate. So even if students take longer to graduate, you still get something. Um, a point of consideration is there are some students um, that are in some special education programs that they typically do spend longer in high school. So it isn't necessarily that a student has not passed on time, um, but that's a limited number. Um, and so you can see that the high school got 10 points for their graduation rate, um, but they did not get points for their grad rate improvement. So their grad rate did not improve from 1920 to 2021, which is what this is measuring. College and career readiness indicator. Um, they, every single student accumulates points. Um, and then those points are averaged up. Something that I wanted to notice is, um, I kept this in here. Uh, these are the business rules that are given to us by the State Board of Education. Um, and uh, even though grades now are out, um, there's still things that are to be determined. So it is very difficult, uh, and it's, it's throughout. Um, the document, it is very difficult to determine what you're trying to move to um, when, you, when you have to be determined. And so um, I understand some of them are comparisons to other schools, so they would have to be, um, but there's some of them that are not. And so here is all the different areas that students can earn college and career readiness points. I'm going to have to, I don't know what I'm going to have to do to look, so I'm going to have to use my really good eyes. So it is everything from um, 
completing a CTE sequence, um, passing, um, um, doing well on the ACT, meeting cut scores on the SAT, so if the student's uh, selecting to take the SAT, uh, meets um, the cut score on any AP exam, completing the FAFSA, um, taking a college-level career pathway course, taking college-level English, math, science, social studies, or a foreign language, um, so any dual or concurrent enrollment, um, a CTE course in a sequence, uh, meeting benchmarks for the ASVAB, uh, work keys, uh, taking the Accupacer, um, Alex Compass, uh, so these are usually um, given to students before uh, placement for dual enrollment, although I think they've suspended that um, since COVID, uh, clepping out of a class, getting a certification. Uh, when I talked to some high schools that are A's, they said uh, a way that they really boosted the points that students were getting uh, was to complete, having students complete a well-defined work-based learning program or internship of at least 120 hours. Uh, when I talked to Marsha Becker today, this year we had one student complete that. And so if you see there's things that are worth 0.5 points or 0.35, that is worth one. And then being ABOR ready. So having all of the classes that are needed in order to get into a state university. So a student would get one point for that. That's just another look at what is filled out for every single student in the entire high school um, by the high school administration. Um, and the high school got 12.6 points in this area. Is that like an average of all the students? How do they get that? So every student does it, then it's the average of all the students? Yes, yeah, so every student does it. And then is, it compa is this one compared to the state? Um, So then, I mean, like, how do they determine that 12.6? So every student has their score that, you know, they they have all of their ABORs and then mm -hmm. they passed an AP test and they add all those up for them. It, I do not see the calculate like so there's there's some of these give us math problems this one does not actually um it does not say how that it just says schools can download the student level spreadsheet to assist with the calculations outlined below schools should look over each student's entire high school experience and the metrics schools submit their points to ade through ade connect uh, the indicators capped at 23. The calculation. I couldn't find out. Um, usually, the the business rules have been pretty good at telling us, but I don't see this particular one. Yeah, that's just a curiosity. I know it's something where they're comparing all the students to see kind of what the average is. Right. Just wondering how that is. And I can and. And so you can, like, up here it tells you how to get the bonus points, but I can't. But that's per student, correct? Yeah. Yes. On the indicators, some of them are red and some of them are blue. If you said what the difference is, I missed it. So the, um, you can get, You can accumulate at least one indicator point of red, and at least your goal is to accumulate one of each to generate 22 points. Um, exactly what they are, I believe. 
Sure, and I believe they have to do with academic versus career. So the blues are going to be the academics. So think ABOR versus internship, ASVAB, CTE versus AP. And again, that's something to consider is there is um, a very high weight on completing the FAFSA in terms that you can use those points wherever it benefits you. Um, and all this, although the school um, works with families to complete it, um, this is something that is outside of the school's control to actually submit that. So. There's a number of different ways to get bonus points for the high school. Uh, as you saw in that college and career uh, self-report section, um, if you increase their prior year post-secondary and military, military enrollment uh, percentage or have 85%, you get the bonus point. Uh, special education and enrollment seekers get the fun calculations. Um, I hope they didn't have that for CCRA. Um, uh, and then looking at ACT Aspire and Science Proficiency. And so the high school got bonus points. Uh, they increased that uh, post-secondary uh, enrollment. They got the two SPED bonus points, and so they got three. Um, and the high school is AV. Does anybody have any questions about the high school? Uh, here is our historical letter grades, um, although I don't necessarily, I think all, all schools want an A or a B, right? Like that is, that makes us feel good. Um, what I know is there's no school that is somehow magically different in 2022 versus 2020 or 2017. Um, and so when we think about grades, um, you know, we have to know that they're one picture um, and that this year's grade or last year's grade does not make or break a school. Um, but I thought that this was an important picture. Um, and again, 2020 is carried over from 2019. So um, the schools really have not had letter grades um, since that time. And then this is just a breakdown. Um, we've spent a lot of time uh, looking at well, what has changed um, and, and what are some of those areas. And so, you know, some of the things are, you know, the rate of growth. And if we look back um, going into COVID, uh, you know, for the most part, our schools, our schools all had uh, very high levels of proficiency. And so um, how do you keep growing upon that, um, especially in terms of a curriculum implementation, um, and then, uh, you know, all that happened with COVID. Um, and then we have schools, Starline, again, did not get that 10 EL points, um, and that really did make a big change. So this, we have this for all of the years and just being really, um, really understanding where we've gotten points in the past um, and, and where we believe um, are the best ways to get points in the future. Because again, it's a snapshot. This seems like I'm being grade gr I'm being that kid who's being grade grubby. Um, but I know that um, the feeling of A feels good for people. And so that is the, the game that the state has laid out um, for us to play. And so the other thing to note is the way the high school has been figured is a little bit different. Uh, their, their score has changed slightly. Um, whereas the, the K-8 really is pretty um, similar between the years. Okay. 
I want to um, impart that this is not the only data that we look at, um, and this is not the only data that describes our schools. And so I, we just chose two pieces of data, um, but there's a lot of it. Uh, and so we're going to talk about DIBBLES, which is that early literacy, because again, when we talk about what we need from our students, uh, reading in third grade is really very important. And so DIBBLES uh, looks at the dynamic indicators of basic early literacy skills, um, and these are how we measure literacy skills in our students. This is a national um, assessment, and so um, what we're showing you is last year's data. Um, so this is 21-22 uh, data. These are, this is our DIBBLES data at the beginning of the year. So we uh, assess our students, um, K-3, every one of our students, and then we assess our four, six students who um, have special needs, and we continue to DIBBLE them. And so looking at this data, um, what we see is that in grades two and three, our students are at or above benchmark, um, and they're close to national trends. However, our students, so beginning of the year, so this is coming to us, um, we're below national trends. And so looking here is our kindergartners. So these are just kids who are first time coming to us. When we compare those students to students nationally, the students that are coming to us are not as proficient in those early literacy skills. And we move them up, so you can see we're catching up to national, we're surpassing national, we're right with national. And so really thinking about the importance um, of early education um, and that our teachers are doing an excellent job supporting literacy um, as we move forward. That, to me, is fundamentally important, um, is understanding that um, where we are, are with national. So here's our fall far below students. Um, again, this is beginning of the year. So these are kiddos that are just coming to us. The DIBBLES test is usually given within the first month of school. Um, so what's in red, there are two different years, they're national scores, but students who are fa falling far below um, in kindergarten. So just coming to us or above national. And then you can see over time, um, and although this is a different cohort of students, um, what we see is we're going below national. And so what we're doing to teach students to read um, is working. Um, and this is just looking again at beginning um, year averages and comparisons. Um, and so again, those, those grade K kiddos um, were below the national average, um, we're below the national average, again, when they're coming to us, but as we get up into um, grade three, we're improving, we're beating the national. To note, there's grade four and five here. We do not assess all of our students. These are only our special education students, so we can see um, this is not our whole population. So this is the end of the year. So again, we looked at the end of the year data. Um, so we've taught them all year long. We're continuing to assess their literacy. Um, again, our kids by the end of the year um, are above um, national trends. Um, again, our, our students in K-1, they're, they're getting there. They've closed that gap from beginning to end of year, um, but there's still opportunity there. Same thing, um, grades one through three, we have fewer uh, far below from beginning to end of the year. Um, and then we're right on par. So our kindergarten kids are right on par with national average. So thinking at the end of the year, so thinking where they come to us and where they end with us, um, there's a lot of growth being made. The other piece to me, at the end of the day, what really matters, um, and when we think about our vision, is what happens to our children when they leave us, right? So I know it's very important that our fifth graders know the fourth grade stuff and our transition to high school is amazing, but what we really need to be looking at is are the humans that are graduating from our school um, going and being productive? 
And so uh, ASU has this amazing tool, um, and it's just one piece of the data, but ASU has a tool, and it tells us about our students um, who, uh, these are our 2021 grads, who attended um, Arizona U University, so we had 73. Um, and then 46 of those had transfer credits by the time they got there. Um, we can see their majors. There's a lot more data here. Um, ASU has a full dis decision center where you can look at all this data. Um, and you can see the vast majority of our students um, who transitioned to an Arizona university um, have GPAs higher than 3.0. So again, one piece of data at the university. Um, and then looking at our community college students, um, so this is 18, this is, sorry, this is three-year data from 18 to 21. So these are our students who are in community colleges. Um, here are their major disciplines, and you can see their success percentage, which I believe is a C or above, um, versus the Arizona statewide. You can see that our students um, are doing better than the statewide average on every single major except for poli sci or, um, and nutrition, because I love the classroom industry, um, and nutrition. So, um, so anthropology, is that, yes, anthropology. Um, so, but we can see overall our students are doing well in community college. Uh, here is, and again, this is just looking at, at that enrollment and what that actually looks like. Um, and so that dashboard is, is one piece of things that we look at, uh, but when we're looking at post-secondary outcomes, that community college information and that state and university information is a, is a big piece of it. Okay, next steps. Um, thinking about what we have learned from this, uh, emphasizing the Azela testing with EL teachers and families, making sure uh, teachers of English learners understand what is on the Ozella and how to better support students, not just for our grade, but so we can support students moving out of, uh, out of um, that EL population and they're, they're, uh, they're receiving uh, general services. Uh, ensure all students who need support with literacy skills have access to intervention, uh, focus on grades K through three. Continuing to support reading and math intervention at Thunderbolt and Lake Havasu High School with Read and Math 180. We just implemented Math 180 last year. So far, it uh, is very successful. Uh, Mrs. Gray and Mr. Olson are actually taking a, a walk through um, those classrooms today, and we have data on that, but I decided it was enough data. Uh, continuing to focus on Tier 1 instruction, so that, that main teacher-directed instruction, student practice and formative assessment, Analyze subgroup data for student performance, so making sure that all of our students, um, not just the students that um, mostly will do well with or without us, but all of our students um, are improving. Uh, supporting the principal and site use of data. The reality is, is this really needs to be in the hands of principals um, so they can support those decisions and they've made great progress in the past two years. Um, encouraging positive student attendance. Continuing to support new teachers, we know um, that there is a, a new, my new word, reigning of teachers. Um, the teachers who are teaching today are much more novice than the teachers who are teaching pre-COVID. How are we ensuring that every single student has access to an excellent teacher um, that supports them in all the ways and also prepares them for that state test? And then increase access to dual enrollment and AP courses for Lake Havasu High School. We're still brainstorming ways, but those are kind of the things that we're working on in the short term. Are there any questions? Very thorough presentation. Um, one of my favorite ways of, of thinking about data is that it's best used as a flashlight instead of a hammer. And so I really appreciate the detailed um, look at what we can do next to support all of our schools and bring everyone up to where we would like them to be. The other thing, um, and you touched on it a little bit, but Oro Grande has had um, the curriculum that they have now, they've had that in place for, I believe they're in their fifth year of implementation. And so it really does sort of underscore how beneficial it is for a school to have um, 
be consistent curriculum and and have something that articulates through all the grades and have that applied. And, and all five of our other elementary schools are only in their second year of implementation of that program. So, and so the test was taken during the spring of their first year. Yes. Yeah, and adding on with the oral grande, the other piece of the component is uh, teacher turnover there too. It's, from what I understand, it's the lowest in the district. So those types of things have a real big impact. And that is why I really am excited about uh, the future and seeing here. I mean, I know, you know, there are some bumps and some things to work on, but, you know, this grade is a lot of it is, uh, some of it is due to COVID and knowing the rules and knowing the game. You mentioned playing the game, not a thing I really like to do with education. I don't think uh, parents like to do either. But this is the game we're given. And I also like that you're presenting other data pieces to the public. Uh, other data pieces are very important. Uh, I know, being a college professor, how hard it is to get post-secondary data. So, um, you know, because students go off and do all sorts of things, uh, you know, military, out-of-state colleges, uh, lots of different things, training programs outside of the state. So giving those pictures uh, to the public here along with the grades is very important. I really do appreciate the step through because I know as a parent, if my kid comes home with a grade that I don't like and they don't like, the first question is why? What happened? What can we do to improve it? You know, is it something that is an easy thing to fix, or is it something like, oh, what, we have to go in and talk and have a major intervention? <laughs> so um, that is really what I believe with this is for. And like I said, with uh, and, and uh, Ms. Roman said, is kind of like with the success of Oro Grande and the curriculum, I do believe we're in a great direction. Uh, you know, and seeing as a lot of that stuff was COVID related, I would see a, a, an improvement. Just based on that, I would think there would be some next year just for that, and then hopefully an improvement based on this being the third year of the curriculum uh, through, the, through the grade school and in a couple of years curriculum-wise with the middle school and high school. So I'm optimistic and looking forward to that. Any other questions or comments? Excuse me, but do we overall compare well in the state with other schools? Um, these are not necessarily the grades no, that okay. I want. So, yeah, I mean, I would say we see many school districts that are in the realm of where we are. I will be honest, being that elementary, 50% is growth, and we went in very high. Um, there are other schools that their proficiency is lower than us, but they grew because all you had to do is grow this much and you grew. So um, I would say with the um, appeals, should they go through, um, then yes. Do again, I was a helicopter mom. Um, do I want my kids bringing home that? Not necessarily, but I think for the snapshot that it was, it's a starting place. Yeah, and you know, uh, this type of program with the state and going on during COVID, you know, I, I always have a problem personally with uh, these types of grades uh, overall. I mean, I, I think a lot of times they're just there to give the public some information. But digging deep is really what you need to do to find out the whys, and that's why I appreciated that. Um, I, I agree exactly with what Jamie said. You know, there's a few there that I'm like, uh, but I can see why. And to me, optimistic, you know, th this part of with COVID going on, these grades to me don't mean a lot. Next year's grades will have a little bit more weight. So that's personally why. Any other questions, comments? Then we will move on. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it. And thank you, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Marcia. Uh, so I will take a motion to adjourn.
my children. Wait a second. Adriana Aliar? Yes. Kyle Niederman? Lisa Roman? Yes. John Mazden? Eric Aran? Yes, we are adjourned.